What is up, everybody? Welcome on into the call up. I am Susanna Collins alongside the fabulous Jillian Sackovitz. And speaking of fabulous, we have an incredible episode uh, for you guys today. Fresh, literally minutes off of re signing with Toronto FC. We have uh, Justin Morrow, who again just re signed for this eighth season with Toronto. We talked to him about everything under the sun, including um, his role as executive director with Black Players for Change, the challenges of being on a Canadian club right now during this pandemic stretch, what that has been like, um, what life at home is like for the Morrow family. And we also have a brand new segment for you guys that we're very excited about called What's in the Bag? You know, those little vanity bags that the players always walk into the stadium with? We find out what's in Justin's bag. This is good, Jill. This is real Suze, good. Give your, I'm going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> this is what the podcast is all about. The, the conversations and the things that you and I usually text about off to the side and you, my friend, have said for years, now what's really in that bag? And don't they want it to be a backpack? Because who wants to carry basically a man clutch? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. We hate clutches as women. They're really annoying. And so I've been fascinated by these vanity bags and uh, what's inside them. So And Justin, I think, just pulls back the curtain. And I think we are in for some big lessons. 100%. 100%. Um, okay, before we get into uh, the episode, and this is, I have to do this now because obviously Justin plays for Toronto. So this would have been so shady if I had either worn this or presented it. But yeah, don't throw off our guest, girlfriend. Montreal, you guys, Montreal, Club de Foot, Montreal, who went through the rebrand, sent me a new jersey personalized jersey. Look at that. Collins 21 on the back. And I have to say, I am so digging. I, if you can see it, if you're watching this on YouTube, that snowflake kind of print is sort of embedded into the black material and it looks really, really sharp. So I wanted to thank them for this, but um, Jill, you know, it's so weird. Like I haven't gotten mine yet. That's so weird. It must have gotten oh, lost my in the God. mail. Yeah. You know, I live so far away from you that I I just, know. I'm sure. Mm. You know what? Mm. Mercy, Montreal, because I know mine is on the way. That's just so weird. I'm going to keep clinging to the Colorado Rapids, the only team to give us <laughs> call-up ones, and I'm going to stick with that. So, Montreal, you know what? Listen. Whatever. You have been you've been warned, Montreal. It's up Don't to mess. you now. Ball's in your court, people. Shall we get into a little here for this? Here sister? for this. Well, what one we thing got? we can both be here for this week is Houston, Dallas, and Austin's uh, player efforts to help their communities through the terrible weather and the crisis, frankly, in Texas. If you have the means, please visit the respective club sites. You can, again, go to Houston, Dallas, or Austin's um, or their Twitter pages and see how you can contribute. We are just sending lots of thoughts and prayers uh, to the people of Texas because this has been tough to watch. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it, it's unbelievable what has been going on there. I'm from Chicago, live in New York. You know, we are equipped to deal with the elements, you know. Um, Texas is not. Texas just is not. And this crazy ice storm and frigid temperatures came and the entire state was basic, basically shut down. And seeing the sort of videos of, of what people were going through was really heartbreaking and shocking. And a lot of the players, too, they were without electricity. They were without heat. Um, and the fact that these clubs came together and, um, you know, were able to sort of put out this this effort to help people in need, I think, is is really remarkable. And like Jill said, if you can donate do it. Something else that we are here for, we talked about it last week, as we know, Ashlyn Harris and Allie Krieger adopted a beautiful little baby girl named Sloane Phillips. Well, Sloane is killing it already. Okay. She's like weeks old. And this kid is so cool because not only did she, she has her own Instagram page, but Megan Rapino scores a goal in the She Believes Cup um, it's a two nil win over Canada. She runs up to the camera and her goal celebration is a little, she's rocking a baby, a tribute to little Sloan Phillips. And so this kid is literally already getting love on a national stage from Megan Rapino, who is one of the coolest athletes in the world. And I'm, I am here for it, Jill, but I'm jealous. I am jealous of an infant. 
I did a little research last night, and last I checked, as of Monday evening, Baby Sloan had 42,000 <laughs> followers on Instagram. <laughs> so you go, Baby Sloan, because I'm going to live vicariously through you. Um, One last year for this, Jill. I love that you have the Colorado Rapids jersey hanging up <laughs> in, the, in the background because the Rapids um, have done something really fun this this off season. So, um, you know, they're already in that competitive spirit which we love. So this was a pre pre-season best dressed bracket. That's aggressive. Okay? Like it's like we are not the pre pre-season. Like pre has pre-season hasn't even started and they're already going in. It's like pre-off season. Like what? But um it ended up being um Keegan Rosenberry. Hmm who won and they showed, they showcased a couple looks of him. He actually went up against himself at one point. Like he had said so many, what does that say though about his teammates? Like how bad are they dressed <laughs> that you guys can't get five good outfits together? But I believe it was him and Jonathan Lewis that were in up against each other a good in, one. in the final who is, he's also incredibly stylish and Keegan killed it So You know, he had like the, the trench coat on or the, the camel coat, like the glasses, the whole, the whole shebang. He ends up winning the whole thing, but chill. He yes. was aggressively campaigning hmm. to win this. How hmm. do you feel about that? <laughs> so initially you're like, no, but you know what? Don't hate the player, hate the game. This is the freaking world that we live in. This is the monster that we have created. And we have talked about this from a professional standpoint. You have to be a shameless cringeworthy and i'm not saying that you are any of these things uh, to our call-up friend keegan who has been on the show <laughs> we love um it. but love you it. have to be a shameless self-promoter to even stay like medium level so you know what like this is what we have created as a society <laughs> and keegan fault. is just doing what he has to do i it's, don't hate it it's our fault. i hate that we did it to him i know but I, we did. I hate that we did it to me and to you, but I, we did. It's a hundred percent true. And I remember last year when we did MLS Idol during the uh, the break when the season was suspended. It was that talent show that we yes. that we did, and Keegan was doing the the trick shots, which were completely very good, incredible. very good. Yes, very impressive. He was also aggressively campaigning. Did he win? Season. I think he did win his episode. I'm pretty sure he won his episode. Suze, let's be honest though. As what? a as a former winner, you're talking to a winner. Talent's got nothing to do with that. You gotta you gotta work for a good fan base. And I think my I thank you, Atlanta United, because <laughs> I was not the most talented one, Susanna Collins. You were. And uh, uh, just a good fan base can go a long way. But you know what? Maybe if I had com campaigned for myself a little bit harder, maybe if I had taken cues from Mr. Keegan Rosenberry, we'd oh. be having a different conversation right now. Time now for at and 5G call to the field, MLS Cup champion, TFC veteran defender, and executive director of Black Players for Change. We are so excited to welcome in today, Justin Mora. Yay! Hey ladies, how you doing? This is a this is a true call to the field. We just got off the training pitch, so I'm like basically this, still. This background is so good. Justin, <laughs> this is the best I've ever win. done. The best for you. <laughs> for those of you listening, Justin Morrow has already won the uh, ambiance award here mm -hmm. on the call up. He comes in with a nice, nice shot of BMO Field. He's fresh off the pitch. I mean, we we never get this kind of treatment. I know. I'm trying. I'm <laughs> well, you win. Okay, let's get right into it. Now, if your Wikipedia is correct, which we have learned it is not always, uh, it said you're born I can in Cleveland. tell you what it is. Don't worry. Born in Cleveland. Did you write it? <laughs> no. <laughs> born in I Cleveland, Ohio. Um, now, you said you've played all sports growing up, but it ended up being soccer. That kind of sent you on your way. Why was it soccer? And how did Justin Morrow become a soccer player? Um, yeah, like typical American family. I was playing everything playing. Uh, I got, I got up to flag football. I never got to tackle football. Um, thank God, but I played <laughs> basketball. Um, I played, I played baseball for a little bit, wanted to play hockey, but it was too expensive. Ran track. I did, I did it all and I did it all up until high school. And then, you know, then you gotta, gotta get picky and start selecting what you're really going to run with and soccer was always it for me because it was my first you know I, I just really enjoyed having the ball at my feet 
Uh, my closest relationships off the field came from from on the field playing soccer and I uh, just had a love for it. And so it, it stuck. Did you grow up in Cleveland? I did. did. Born and raised in Cleveland. I didn't leave until I left for, for college when I was 18. Okay, college. This is a perfect segue. Justin, I'm a, I'm a, a fellow Midwesterner. <laughs> okay. I hail from Downers Grove, Illinois, which is a, a western suburb of Chicago. You went oh, yeah. to Notre Dame. Notre Dame. Yeah teammates with Beasler. Um, and I'm sure, as you know, in the Midwest, Notre Dame is a very polarizing institution. Like people either love Notre Dame or they hate it. And it elicits reactions <laughs> either way, right? It's like Notre Dame yeah. football, love it, hate it. I have friends that went there and like their whole families are like super into it. And it's just, it's just one of these things where, like I said, it elicits a reaction. Why do you think it is like, why does it have that identity? Why is it so polarizing? Well, it's it's hard to say, but I would just point towards the history. Like, the, the craziest thing for me is Notre Dame is not that big of a school. It's got, mm -hmm. like, um, let's say 6,000 undergrad. Really? Um, but they, they pack 80,000 into their stadium every weekend for yep. football, right? So it's like people come from all over to come to these games, and – the amount of young kids that you see at the games, I'm talking like kids that are way too young to understand American football, have no idea what's going on. It's just like bred in the family and bred mm -hmm. in them. So people grow up with Notre Dame from a very young age. And that's why the people like that love Notre Dame. <laughs> and then the people on the outside see it and they're like, they just don't get it. You know, it makes no sense to them. So it's kind of like a, a cultish thing, but in a good way. It's crazy. What was it like? Because it does have such a such an identity associated around the the uh, the American football team. What was it like being a soccer player at Notre Dame? What were those experiences like for you? It was great. I mean, I, I loved it. Um, it wasn't too far from home for me. It was just far enough away where I could say that I wasn't in Ohio anymore. But um, my parents could still drive and come watch the game. So that that was awesome. Uh, like you said, being close to Chicago, I was able to get up there a lot. I have a lot of family up there as well. And then when you're there on campus, it's just like this little bubble. Like, I, I don't know if you know about South Bend, but it's like in the middle of nowhere. You know, you're, you're driving on the highway and there's nothing but cornfields. And then the sign for Notre Dame, you, you jump off the highway and it's this beautiful campus and it's kind of secluded. And everyone just really embraces that. You know, it's, there's a true spirit around the school. And that seeps into all of their athletics as well. Um, people from all over the country, you know, being from Cleveland is kind of a small knit community. So that was a little bit of exposure for me to a bunch of different people from, from around the world. And it was my first touching point um, into what it felt like to be a little bit of a professional because they have such nice facilities. The, <laughs> the, the university takes care of you so well. It takes care of their student athletes very well. So very good experience for me. Justin, as you mentioned, you are fresh off of the pitch uh, in Toronto. You're in the trenches of the stadium. You know, it's something you joked with us before you got on that only the older guys kind of know that this little room uh, exists. What's the scouting report? How is TFC feeling now that you're one of the veteran guys uh, in the league and, and on the team? Give us your scouting report. Yeah, everything's going well. You know, we were the the first team to kick off our preseason last week because we have this Canadian Championship game coming up. Everything is getting ramped up super quick. Game's coming pretty soon here. Everyone's taking very well to Chris and the new coaching staff. Um, energy levels are high. There's a lot of learning going on uh, with the way that we're going to play. Very up-tempo. Um, we're going to be putting a lot of pressure on other teams, so... That is all happening on the pitch every single day, and, and guys are loving it. We love to get a sense of sort of what it's like inside the locker room a little bit, and I feel like you're a good person to to ask. You know, you can kind <laughs> of gauge people's personalities. So we just yeah. like real quick kind of rapid fire. Um, we want you – we're going to go through some superlatives here and oh, you just geez. kind of tell right. us who, who it is, okay? All so right. the, the first one, biggest fashionista. Um, oh, so – Yep, I agree. I can see you that. You could guessed that, right? I, I know, 100%. <laughs> His hair is too perfect. It's like, <laughs> it's just, yep. Who controls the locker room playlist? Um, Marky Delgado. 
could see that too. Might you know, me and him once wore like the exact same pair of jeans. <laughs> anyway, that's the story for another time. <laughs> you know what's sad? His jeans are probably like smaller than mine. Like his may have. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, can't, even, can't even deal. Um, Justin, who's the biggest prankster in the locker room? Oh, um, it was Laurent. And, and um, now I'll say maybe one of the young guys, um, Richie Larea. Yeah. Richie's, Richie loves a, a good prank. Love Richie Larea. That's cool. Team chef. Me. Yeah. What do you like to cook? Do you bring oh, stuff I, in for I, the guys? I can cook up anything. Um, if No, if I'm bringing something in, it's probably like um, some type of pastries, you know, on my way into the training ground get the morning coffee, some pastries. But um, if I'm cooking something, probably something Italian. I love a good lasagna. That was, mm. that, was my first, mm. uh, that was my first lesson, cooking lesson that I took. So it's pretty good. It's good. It, and it, it, it's, it makes you feel like you actually know what you're doing. You know? Yeah, it does. It's not that hard, but the, it looks like it's more um, you know, complicated than it is. Wait, so quick it, question. When you say cooking lesson, do you mean you took cooking lessons? Yeah. Yeah. I took cooking lessons. That's I was, amazing. I was living on my own in the beginning out in San Jose and I didn't have anything to do. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to cook for myself that I want to make good food. Justin Morrow, secret chef. We <laughs> love... taking it into his own hands too. Yeah. I yeah. like that. I know. I like learning these little nuggets. Um, okay. Who on the team gives, uh, gives the best off field advice? Like who would you go to, to get some life advice from? Um, Omar's Myself. got some good advice. <laughs> Omar! Omar, Omar Gonzalez. <laughs> and you know why? Because he, he, he loves himself a good device. You know, he's got a million things at his house. Um, always bringing it in for the other guys, too. Like, he's got a VR headset. That's oh, incredible. God. He's always got some type of rehab machine that, <laughs> that he's pulling out for guys. <laughs> and he's very generous with it. You know, if somebody else gets hurt, he's like, hey. I got this for you. It's going to help you. <laughs> It'll bring it in. Um, and, and he's just a very nice, calm, relaxed, fun-loving guy. So he's, he's a great guy to listen to. Oh, that's awesome. Last but not least, who's the little brother of the team and the big brother of the team? Oh, little brother of the team is Jaquiel. He's, he's the youngest. I think he turned 17 this year. Um, started, started with us um, two years ago now. So, yeah, he's growing up. He got a big education last year when we were in Hartford and we were all together every single day. So that was, mm -hmm. that was awesome for him. Uh, big brother is probably Michael Bradley. He's, he's always in everyone's ear, um, pushing him in the right ways, uh, tough when he needs to be putting an arm around guy's shoulder when he needs to do that as well. So I'd say he's a big brother. You mentioned your, your new head coach, Justin. Yep. Chris Armis, yeah. um, who it's interesting, you know, he was a, a former teammate of, of Greg Vanny. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, they go, they go way back. What have your conversations been like with him? How do you see, uh, what's the difference going to be basically for, for this TFC team with him at the helm? Yeah, I think you, I mean, to understand the difference, I think you only need to look at the way each of them played when they were players. Mm -hmm. um, and they bring that same philosophy as coaches um chris the first thing that you notice about him is so energetic right and he wants yeah. to give you that off the field on the field every single day he's going to hold guys accountable um to his standard and he's never going to let that drop so those are the things that we're learning here every single day right now and we're when we're just getting started and right now it's just about mentality and, and embracing the mentality that he wants us to play with and so that's what's going on here right now and it's been all good to start with chris let me ask you, you also mentioned, you know, Hartford last year, you know, it's just, I can think of the Toronto Raptors um, playing in Tampa, you guys having to play in Hartford. How challenging was that to have to get through? And now as you look towards 2021 and how the challenges are going to rise again for the Canadian clubs, how does a team get through that? And how much of a wrench does that throw in what is already a long, difficult season? Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I feel like for all of the teams, we're living with this uncertainty, right? It's just COVID is throwing so many challenges at us. Um, and we're just learning to roll with the punches. You know, even this year, we don't have any information yet as a team about what's going to happen to us. Um, 
And so planning with families, all these different types of things that go on off the field, that's, I think that's a really difficult part. But then once you get actually in the situation, like when we were in Hartford last year, I think you saw that we did very well because um, we're a veteran team. We understand each other very well. And when you go through something like that, it kind of hardens you, you know, it it brings you together in a different way. And so we embrace that. And I think we're going to have to embrace it again, come what may and really use it as our edge you know really have a chip on our shoulders because of it and and i know our story got told a little bit last year Mm -hmm. as canadian teams and what we had to endure but i think people still don't realize what we had to go through and so um knowing that we're going to have to do that again this year uh we are going to take it in a different way a way that empowers us a little bit more than using it as an excuse for you personally, Justin, one we had so we had Greg Vanny on the pod uh, last week, and we told him we were going to have you on. Um, and one of the things he he said about you was that he was so impressed with the way that you handled everything that was on your plate last year, and including what you just spoke about, um, you know, having to be away from home, the time in Hartford, but also, you know, heading up the black players for change, um, dealing with this like crazy season where it started and stopped and Orlando and the bubble and all, all of these things. How do you manage all of the things that you have going on? um not very well at times you you only have to ask my wife for that (laughs) god bless her soul she's she's been doing an incredible job at home what's her name Jimena we love to shout out a wife (laughs) I know I know the real Um, heroes I think that's where where you know finding the balance I fall short the most um when I'm trying to find the balance between professional sports um the social justice movement and and family but I think the thing that um, helps me through it is their support, but also when the days are tough, knowing it, that I'm doing it alongside my peers. Right. Um, yeah, my name has been, been thrust to the forefront of this and I've been elected as a leader, but we're doing this together. And, and maybe there are days where my workload is heavier, but there are days when we're all together on calls and, and we have a very special environment because we are player led, you know, guys speak up guys speak up like never before and that's not always the case even in locker rooms or in something like the players association you know it's just like we feel like brothers and so whether it's amongst ourselves or we're talking to potential partners or we're talking to the league about things that we want to work within and change and implement guys speak up and and that's very special because really i feel like i'm in a fight with them and that's special after being in the league for, for so long and playing against these guys so many years, um, day in, day out. Black Players for Change, Justin Morrow, our executive director, our guest today. For our listeners that maybe need a little background, you know, we all remember, sadly, George Floyd, he's murdered on what was May 25th. Black Players for Change is announced just weeks later on Juneteenth. Then in July, you've got the MLS's back tournament. Uh, you know, we all remember... Everyone standing up in solidarity, Um, the T-shirts, everything, like everything had to come together in less than six weeks. When you look back, what comes to your mind? Like, how did you guys do it? Man, that's it's it's hard to say it was so hectic those times. I mean, to be honest, I I hardly look back. Um, It's it's such a big moment in our league's history and our players history. Um, but it's kind of one of those things like I'll, I'll enjoy it when I'm done because I've got so much going on now. You know, we, we've got so much that we still want to accomplish. Um, I think mostly during those days, what I remember um, is everyone pulling above their weight. And when I'm talking about us being players and leading this organization, like you had guys out on that field the night before till like midnight trying to get the coordination down and all these different things. And we're going together to the field and in 26 different vehicles because of COVID protocols and, you know, all these things that had to happen to, to execute on that. And guys just went above and beyond what's required of them. And it was happening then and it's still happening now. And that's why I'm saying that black players for changes is so special because it feels like, you know, 
for the first time we're doing things on our own. And I don't mean to say that we executed that process on our own because we had a lot of help from Major League Soccer. Um, but it feels like we're in the driver's seat. Um, we're making decisions. We're telling our story the way we want it to be told, authentically, um, genuine, not watered down at all. And, and that's what's so cool about us. In terms of social justice and awareness, Justin, um, and looking back on your time um, since heading up the Black Players for Change, as a league, what has improved and where do you think that there's still room for growth? Where are we lacking? Yeah, so we've been working closely with the league on a lot of things. Um, after the, the protest where we decided not to play, in coordination with the Milwaukee Bucks and the NBA, uh, we were able to sit down with the Board of Governors and had a very good touch base to, to explain ourselves, who we are, um, what we care about, what we want to see happen and get buy-in from them. And from that, we were able to create a diversity committee. Um, and so in that committee, there are five from the Board of Governors, players, league office. It's a whole mix of different people. And through that, we'll be able to implement policy and change. And so that stuff is coming. Um, the league just this week announced the hire of a chief D&I officer, yeah. which is something that they've been saying they want to do for a long time. And I think is going to help in terms of having someone day to day in and out on top of these issues and spread out that workload a little bit. And so things are coming through the pipeline. We've always said that we want to increase black representation, you know, more black head coaches, more black executives, front office, assistant coaches. And then on the other end, on the other end of the spectrum, we want to see more black children playing this game um, because we want it to be indicative of our of our community here in North America. We have a very diverse community. And right now our sport just doesn't show that enough and it can be better. So we're going to work on that on the league level for sure. Well, we thank you for everything that you and the entire BPC does because, you know, we're constantly learning. Suzanne and I are constantly going back and forth and we've got a lot to learn. We've got a lot to get better at and we appreciate you guys doing what you do. Absolutely. Of course. Greg Vanny, Justin told us um, that you are a great family man. You mentioned your wife, Hamina. Mm. Tell us about the Morrow House at home. <laughs> uh, what's, what's going on? Because you hear stories oh, from man. across the world like, Kids have been screaming in the back of some of these call up podcasts. <laughs> Someone is home, so man. wishing their kids go back to school. Some have their kids. What is going on? That's a great that's a great <laughs> question, a great timely question because we're up in Canada. There's a two week quarantine for coming back into the country. Um, this off season, I came back earlier than my family to Canada so I could start my preparation. Um, they just got back and went through their two week quarantine. So mm -hmm. wife at home working. Um, nine to five and the two kids at home. My, my oldest daughter, Kiki, she's five. My youngest, Lucia, she's two. Um, I'm just tearing up the house in the back <laughs> of all the, of my wife's calls for work. Um, like I said, God bless her soul. Everything <laughs> that she's been doing, the, the load that she's been carrying. And just um, yesterday they started back at school. So they finished their quarantine. They're back at school and they're, they're two very social children so they're so happy to be back at school with their friends and so yeah everybody everybody's safe doing well very happy all right justin you kind of you know you talked about your conversations with your with your new head coach chris armis um in toronto they're just one of these teams that they're seemingly always sort of in contention you got like over the last five seasons it just seems like toronto is always there they're always in that conversation why will Toronto be successful in 2021? I think everything that we've gone through as a team up until this point has prepared us for this moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Greg leaving, I think, was a surprise to many of us. Many of mm -hmm. us didn't see it coming. Uh, but, you know, since that's happened, I think we all reflected on it and realized that change is constant in sports and uh, once you embrace that and know that maybe a, a new voice could be the thing that gets us even to another level, mm -hmm. um, that's a special thing too. And so what we're going through right now is like a, a refresh moment and, and it can be a new team out there with some of the same players playing a different style. And I think that's very interesting um, because one of the things that Greg did so well with our team was 
helped us play some different styles and different formations, right? And so we have that in our arsenal. We have that in our two belt already. And so now, even with a new coach and a new style, it just becomes another weapon for us. And I think it's going to land very well. We are so excited for TFC in 2021 and Major League Soccer. Before we let you go, Justin, perhaps our most pressing question of the day is maybe a new segment here on the show. We're not sure, but (laughs) you're basically our test run. What's what's in the bag? (laughs) Susanna and I are always talking about, you know, the Louis Vuitton leather medicine bag, the vanity walking bag. in like, y'all like strut into the stadium with yeah. and, like, what? Get, like the money shot and we're always like what is in the bag because uh, seemingly you guys have a lot of stuff in your locker already like what are y'all keeping in the little vanity bag oh that's my that's Knocked my look my good stuff you know? i can't over. i can't keep the waves in here without a nice <laughs> brush i can't <laughs> can't keep the skin soft without the lotion you know you gotta, you gotta treat your body right we go through a lot of stuff out on the field but lotion. here's my question like it can't you don't want to keep it in your locker like you want to bring it back and forth yeah because i gotta use it at home too i want to use right. all this you can't stuff. buy okay so um, totally okay. Okay. okay okay so lotion <laughs> a hairbrush <laughs> do we have like any lip balm like what like what yeah, yeah, we got, uh, we got some perfume in there too. Okay, some oh, cologne. okay, a little little cologne. After yeah. is there anything in there that would surprise us? Some like shaving, some shaving products, nail okay. clippers, you know, okay. all the normal stuff. Okay, okay, because like I don't leave the house. Like I always have um, blotting tissues oh, yeah. in my bag. <laughs> And a safety pin just in case, because you just never know if you're going to have like a wardrobe malfunction, something, you know, these things happen. Is there anything like that would surprise people that, that you just keep in there on the off chance you have to use it? Oh, no, I got, I got no surprises. I'm, I'm, I'm plain Jane in my, my bag. Of your teammates, (laughs) of your teammates, who do you think probably has some things in that bag? Oh, Bono. Bono. Okay. There you go. He's got some fancy stuff in there. Uh Uh-huh. All right. We'll have to chat with him about that. Yeah. On a future episode. Next on the call. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was our first edition of what's in the bag. (laughs) (laughs) Arousing success. We wish you guys such the best of luck. I love what you said about that, you know, the Canadian clubs are likely going to have a challenge this year and um, that you're going to use it in a different way. So we're excited to see that. We're excited for you and we're excited to see what Chris Armas does with this team. What's in the bag? That is going to stick. As for what's in our own little mailbox, mailbag, mailbox, um, Michael Silkowski, a MLS call up, just superstar. We love you, you, Michael. Very avid on Twitter in, um, in, you know, talking to us. We need people mm-hmm. to talk to. He wants to know, Susanna Collins, what is your favorite rivalry moment that you've witnessed? In, what's your favorite rivalry? What's your favorite rivalry moment you've witnessed in person? Okay, so this this is actually pretty easy for me to, to answer. I was at the first ever El Trafico match. Um and that was the, the Zlatan game where he came in in the 72nd minute and scored that ridiculous goal and then ended up oh. scoring the game winner. I mean, in extra time, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And so that's a new rivalry, I realize, and I'm sure I'll catch some, some flack for calling that game out specifically, but I cannot tell you how incredible the atmosphere was at that match. It was insane. Absolutely insane. I can't believe I witnessed it in person. What about you? Got you got Zlatan. I did. I got Zlatan you hard. Literally got Zlatan. Mine would have to be, and no disrespect to Atlanta United, but this one is just, it's more story. And mm-hmm. Atlanta United, I think we'll get there. It's Portland, Seattle yeah. for me. And and you know what? Maybe it's the something about your first. I feel like I'm saying that in the <laughs> right now. But for me, 2015 was my first year working for the league. And I ended up Portland won that year in Portland most of the time. Mm-hmm. And I got to, I got the Cascadia rivalry was my first. And there's nothing being, people talk about CenturyLink, which is now Lumen Field. Lumen Field, um, very good. And the noise and all that. Forget it. I say Portland, Seattle at Providence Park. Oh. There's something about the bowl like feeling of that stadium and the Timbers Army. And that's what I'm going with. Your sister. That's uh, that's a really good shout. Um, guys, don't forget, we're on Sirius XM FC every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. 
Eastern. So um, if you missed us on uh, YouTube or if you missed us where you typically listen to your, your podcast, you can check us out there, which is super exciting. And don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, listen, tell your friends, all of that <laughs> good stuff. We appreciate you. Um, but yeah. Thank you, Justin Morrow, for uh, joining us today. It was a really, really great conversation with him. He's just, he's one of the good guys, Jill. Yeah. You know, he's one of the ones you get off and you're just so impressed by him, you know, setting up his, you know, audio in his own way, having a good BMO field background. I mean, a company man. And then most of all, I love learning more about black players for change and what they've got going on, the genesis of it. And I'm just very thankful that we've got Justin Morrow and all the good people of BPC. 100%. And we are thankful for you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will see you very soon. Have a great week, y'all. Bye.